But we're up and running. We're up and running. Great. Thank you all for being patient with the tech. There we are. Um, so this week, we are going to dive into the first of eight sections in the study where she kind of separates um, scripture into genres or categories and kind of just talks about them um, a little bit more generally. So the study is not really meant to sit there and like go really intensively and nitpick at any one thing. It's more kind of looking at scripture a little more broadly and just kind of having discussion about what might kind of jump out to different people. Um, and uh, so um, why don't we pray first and then we'll dive in. God, thank you for bringing us all together today and giving us an opportunity to open up your word and see what it has to say to us. Um, uh, bless our discussion and um, guide it in the direction you would have it go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so just for reference, because we can, I mean, it's definitely doable to have discussions about this without, without having read the text, but how many people were able to get that first section read? Just so I, okay, so people kind of know where we're going, which is good. Um, so this was kind of an introduction to how the rest of the book will be structured. The first part of each section is, um, because Rachel has a background in um, English literature and, and uh, creative writing, she kind of just reshapes the story, kind of tells her own, um, just what she imagines might have happened at the time. Um, so that was kind of the first section, um, talking about the family that was living in um, exile in Babylon and how the origin stories um, were meaningful to them. So did anyone have any just kind of thoughts or takeaways from that kind of creative retelling? You're talking about the, the temple story? Yeah, the temple yeah. story. Yeah. I love these. I mean, they're just fun because it makes it more, um, I don't know, I feel like I can immerse myself in it, you know, and mm -hmm. feel like I'm part of the story. I guess I was wondering why one story would be more believable than the other to the little boy, Peggy guy. Uh-huh. But his dad, so one, somebody else said the other. I mean, what lends authority to the story? Mm -hmm. you want to listen? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think yeah. that maybe the fact that it was his dad telling it had something to do with that? In the context of the Passover might have went something good to it. Yeah. Well, I think, I think again, it, it, it you know um, presents sort of the the challenge in a way of the, the, these origin stories, right? Right. Because, you know, what, which one's more believable? But they're, um, the, the story is sort of told looking back from the experience of the present, um, you know, as opposed to unearthing this. Because I was going to ask how, you know, that how people felt about, you know, just the similarities with these other stories. And mm -hmm. is that, just, you know, disturbing and stuff? I, but, I think one thing that... I liked was the fact that um, in his dad's story, they weren't slaves to serve right. the God, that they were actually little kings or whatever, you know, and um, I think that spoke to him. That's, that was my thought. Well, when I did the children's message today, um, I was thinking about what makes us believe the what makes us believe the resurrection story, mm -hmm. and it's because we have faith in who told it. Like the the people that first saw it, the disciples in the, that room, they saw it and then they told it and then they told it, and people believed it because they believed who told it to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I never saw Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. I believe he existed. Because someone told it to me, I guess. Right. <laughs> excuse me. You're okay. Would you like a cough drop? No, I have one. I'm going to get a glass of water. Excuse me. So one of the things that she explores a little bit is kind of things 
that um, either stories or um, events that have happened in within a family and how that carries forward into different generations, which I thought was kind of a, a, an interesting perspective. And then because mm -hmm. really hadn't thought about scripture in that way, right? That that kind of plays a role in the Jewish people as a whole and 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 where they came from. Um, so um, do any does anyone have anything they would like to share about something in their families that like there was a story that just kind of carried forward into mm -hmm. future generations or or that you saw maybe influenced how your family functions or um, it has influenced something about kind of how how people interact with each other because of something that happened? That's funny because I, I thought I, we have a fun story. It's not entirely certain that it's true because my great aunt Grace was known for adding, a, you know, <laughs> drama. But it, it and it, but it's not anything that's influenced like how we've interacted or anything. It's about how um, our Scottish ancestors ended up in Ireland. But it's it's kind of a fun story, and yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. We, we had when, um, oh, go ahead, Sam. No, I, I think for me, it's just the opposite. And that is, my family didn't talk at all. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea, none whatsoever, about even how my parents met. Mm -hmm. Because we did never talk about anything. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, the story actually I was thinking about is this, my, my dad likes to retell the story about how he met my mom on a blind date that he fell asleep during. Which makes my existence a little miraculous. <laughs> <laughs> or um, we have a, a, a story that kind of got unearthed when the family kind of put together some back history and you know family tree stuff where um, the first people who settled in Kansas when they came from Chicago was kind of the place they dumped out after they got uh, shipped overseas. And uh, they ended up in Kansas, but they got there too late to build a home. And so they had to basically dig a hole in the side and, and just make a, an underground dugout um, with the two parents and the five kids. Mm -hmm. And they had this giant um, two, like a, like a, uh, bunk bed kind of situation, but it was really big so that the there could be multiple kids. So the three boys were on top and the two girls were on the bottom and there was a lightning storm and the lightning storm struck the um, ground near where that was. And it killed the two boys on the top with my ancestor being the third one in that apparently felt it, but was not harmed. Mm -hmm. um, and so just kind of thinking about that story about you know, the whole like pioneer starting yeah. out, making things, you know, things were hard, but they built things from their hands mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, yeah. you know, just that, that good old Midwestern work ethic mm -hmm. situation really plays out there. Mm -hmm. um, but also makes as it, our family was always really um, big into like doing something better for the next generation. Like my grandparents were always like, you've got to get an education, right? Like that was like the big thing. And so mm -hmm. that played out um, right. kind of going forward after the hardships that they experienced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, so how many of you, how many of your families are from Washington state? How far back? Right, but, but that's part of what I'm getting at, right? <laughs> so like, do you all have memories of stories that your like your parents, your grandparents told about coming out here for the first time? Yes, no. No, they did tell. Them. They did tell stories about those, right? Yeah, my mom was the storyteller in our family. My dad wasn't. I know almost nothing about my dad's family. Mm -hmm. My mom, was, she was quite proud of the family, and we were supposed to live into their shadow. I think. Mm -hmm. um, and. That was sort of the when I was it was quite small. I would would hear stories like that both at bedtime and and getting up time. Ooh. More and more yeah. getting up. Yeah, in psychology, we refer to the, the there's a member of the family called the kin keeper, uh -huh. and it's usually a woman who gathers the stories of the family and tries to preserve them and then pass them down. They often have these origin stories. 
like this, right? About how a family like came to be. Like, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just like this. my my grandpa. We're I'm fourth generation Californian, and I mean, mm -hmm. he's got stories of you know. My my grandpa was older than my grandma, but his family were basically kind of migrant workers. Almost they traveled in a covered yeah. wagon and all oh, of that. Cool. Like, it's it's super cool. We've got all those stories. Yeah, so yeah. it's kind of. Yeah, and I'll, I will stir the pot on one more topic here, real quick. Um, so, do any of you have family in the Midwest? Mid Ed, how many do you have family in the Midwest? Yes. How many of those family members told you stories about what it was like to live during the Dust Bowl? Mm -hmm. Some. Well, my my father's family moved. Um, I believe just before that. Mm -hmm out to california so so we didn't have that yes gotcha. her part of it but you've got a story about your family moving out to california uh, right? I've, got, I've, <clears throat> I've got a story of my father's side of the family uh coming over on the mayflower oh wow yeah yeah you, you pose an interesting geography question. Where is the Midwest? <laughs> right. And now, now, and now, and right. we, we fell down a hole last time when we were talking about genre. And I'm going to try to reel us in from not falling down the hole debate in the Midwest and what it actually is. Uh, but yeah, but like if you grew up, like my family, we lived in Oklahoma. I grew up in Oklahoma, right? And um, Sarah's family grew up in Kansas. So uh, you had a story about, I can't remember if it, no, it actually been, might have been on my side of the family. Um, stories about after dust storms blowing through and just caking everything with dust, the the moving of dust, especially over anything metal, like over barbed wire, creates a static charge. And people learn really fast that you do not touch anything metallic after a dust storm because it could shock you. And in some cases, it could kill you if the charge was enough. So that's how I that's how I learned what static electricity was. Wow. Uh, was from yeah. grandparents telling me these stories about don't touch the fence after you've had a bad dust storm. Well, my grandpa, because they had a family of nine, mm -hmm. um, they fed themselves by going out and shooting jackrabbits because that was the only thing there was an abundance of. Mm -hmm. And so he had a very firm belief that guns were meant to provide food for the family to feed. And so when World War II came up, he was not uh, he was not a conscientious objector, but he went into the service as a medic because he was just very uh, had a firm belief that that's mm -hmm. not what he thought guns were for. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a story that kind of carries forward. Um, he was the not he didn't go overseas and he was the closest to die of any of the brothers in his family. So that's uh, when you talk about like mm -hmm. it's a it's a miracle that I exist. There are so many people <laughs> along the way that you're like, right. I could have not been here. Right. But I mean, isn't that kind of the purpose of these origin stories, though, is to kind of make you step back and take stock of how you got here. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm, I'm always I like to watch uh, Finding Your Roots on TBS, you know, where those are fun. Yeah. And a lot of people don't have their origin stories mm -hmm. as part of it. And just how satisfying it is for them to learn mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. about their past. So in light of that, let's read the first chapter of Genesis. Do people need Bibles? Yeah, that's a good question. We haven't brought up the new ones yet. We have not brought up the new ones yet. I, I, I thought whoever lived in, like whoever was writing it, lived someplace like Port Angeles, where you had a lot of days where it was, was morning and mm. you couldn't see the sun. <laughs> right, because the sun doesn't show up for a little while. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. 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 No, that makes sense. That's pretty funny. How long is it? Not that long. It's sort of fun to think with. Like I had to write an origin story of creation of these words. Mm -hmm. How would I go about doing that? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, you know, I, I think about that a lot too. So who would like to do, who could maybe get verses one through, oh, let's say one through eight? Who can warm us up? I can do that. Okay, go ahead, Becca. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, 
The earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And who'd like to get maybe nine through, oh, how many days do I want to give you? Let's do nine through 19. I can do that. Go ahead, John. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered in place and let the ground, dry ground appear. It was so God called the dry ground land, land and he gathered the water that he called seas. And God said it was good. Then God said, let the, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants, trees, and land that seeded according to their various kinds. And so the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and, and trees bearing fruit was seeded according to their kinds. And it's all good. And there was evening, there was morning. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark season, days, and years, and let them be light in the expanse of the sky in the bunch of earth. And it was so. God made two two great lights. The greater light governed the day and the lesser light governed the night. He also made the stars. God that set them in the expanse of the, of the sky to mother to govern the sky and the dark and to separate those. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. Cool. And who could get, uh, hang on, Winston through, uh, what do we call this? Gosh, actually, who would like to finish it out? I mean, it's really not that terribly long. Who wants to bring us home? No one. Is there no designated driver? Where did you want to go? Uh, let's just do 20 to the end of the chapter. Okay. And God said, let the water team with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created great creatures of the sea and every living, moving thing, which the water teams according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening. And there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, living livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. 
and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Okay. Um, without going into like nitpicking needling, is there anything just reading that that jumps out at you this time that hasn't jumped out at you before? Or any kind of overarching themes that you see? In this last section, uh, God says something like, I give you all these things. Mm -hmm. Who is he speaking to? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. See, I have given you every planet, yeah. And humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they're it's created to be Right. Yeah. yeah. And then he says we too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I think this is before he's created the humans. Huh? No, it's right nope. now. Humans yeah. are. Yeah. 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 So the so second is humans. Yeah. Right. 26 and 27, yeah. Right, because this is the what we think of as the first creation story that's present in Genesis. And when it switches over into the narrative that includes specifically Adam and Eve, that's the second creation story. So he's not speaking to the animals, then he's speaking to humans. Presumably. Presumably speaking to humans. Or if you, one other way you could interpret this is you can think of it as God is talking to the reader or is talking to the person who is listening to the story. Right? So remember years ago, when, and we do it in years, years ago, when the theology professor was explaining the whole cosmology thing about like mm -hmm. turtles and pillars and mm -hmm. hard earth and then the hard sky above and the dome. Yeah. The dome. Right. And so there's that. And I, even at the time, I didn't really recognize the invitation to question, which is like, it's like right there. Yeah. Because this science doesn't hold up. You know? No, not at all. <laughs> I, and it, just speaking as a scientist and as a believer, when I look at this, I mean, it's interesting. It, it definitely tells me who was doing the creating. It doesn't tell me much about the how, but it is interesting to sort of see the occurrence of when certain things appear. And some of those actually do kind of line up with what we would expect after the earth had actually formed uh, due to gravity sort of drawing in materials, like certain stars in the sky wouldn't have appeared for a really, really long time. And I mean, vegetation and life showing up in the sea first, that makes sense with land animals falling. It's like, huh, that's interesting that it actually kind of goes in that particular order. So that always stuck out to me. I thought it was kind of cool. Any others? As I realize I need to silence my phone. Again, hang on. We started out vegetarian. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean. The third three is the, the light. It's all day. The light oh. was called evening. But then he doesn't create the sun and moon until the fourth day, so right. all those plants live that were created for certain day, you know. Unless there was some kind of algae that just did right. pretty well. I mean, there was light, and if you've got light, you can have algae. I had the thought of, you know, how the dome was supposed to separate the water above and the water below, and I know the water represents chaos and all that, but I, I had the thought, I wonder if they thought water was above because of rain. Like, where would the rain come right. from? There must be water above. Right. I never had thought of that before. Mm -hmm. So it was like a shower. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. Like a water tank above you. Yeah. <laughs> I think if God has a really wicked, wicked sense of humor, we'll discover that at the edges of infinity, mm -hmm. like the dome. <laughs> <laughs> and then I guess something going I was like, <laughs> put this just here to mess with you. Yeah. That would be awesome. I am. Um... I studied this through an organization called Crossways. Mm -hmm. And for Crossways, as we looked at chapter one, it's really set in terms of worship. Mm -hmm. So much is repetitious. Mm -hmm. So many things are repetitious. 
and it really seemed to be a liturgy. Mm -hmm. uh, it does have that flow to it, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And with crossways, <clears throat> this perhaps was part of the liturgy that was used early on Ooh. in the church. That's very cool. Yeah. You know, if we read scripture kind of with what we bring to the table, um, my table has nothing on it about science, no interest in science, so I never got any real thrill out of detailing whether one thing should come after another or mm -hmm. if it was correct or if it was seven days or young earth or older. What stood out to me was God created. Mm -hmm. And I remember the pastor, I can remember his name now, First Preston Spokane back in the 80s. He always kind of referred to God as the creator, redeemer God. And for some reason, that just fixed mm -hmm. a, a kind of a, a stake in my little budding theological or Christian mind, the creator, redeemer God. And that's all that mattered to me. So it's interesting mm -hmm. hearing you all, mm -hmm. you know, talk in either some detail or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, all this particulars of this stuff. I just never really caught that because mm -hmm. I don't have, have an interest, I guess, or, just, you know, age or a skill or whatever it is. But God created it. Mm -hmm. That was kind of important mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. It is. one thing I, I think is interesting too, and this is probably more a a, um, a, a factor of, of where somebody decided the chapter should be. Oh, yeah. Because we didn't finish the creation story. No, right. 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 We, we didn't get to the seventh day. And, and I think even for us, we look at it and we think, oh, that's, but I, I think for, for many early readers, it, the focus was actually on the seventh day as, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, for the Sabbath, mm -hmm. right? You know, this is the story about how the Sabbath came about. Are, are um, you asking us to read those? Well, not <laughs> but, but I, I'm, I mean, I count myself in that camp. I mean, we don't, mm -hmm. we don't think about Sabbath in really so much in our, I mean, we talk about it from time to time, like yeah, we mm -hmm. can do this, but we don't practice it, you know, at, at, in any form close to, you know, how, mm -hmm. how the first readers would have. And so that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Anyway. Just a thought. And it's also interesting that in the Ten Commandments, as they're given in various places, one focuses on the Sabbath, one focuses on the uh, Exodus. <laughs> so two different focuses on the Sabbath yeah. as the Ten Commandments. So to put this actual origin story in the context of kind of what Rachel did by talking about it. I thought it would be interesting to rewind our personal clocks a little bit. How many of us grew up in the church as children? So, and I'm assuming in Sunday school classes, we all talked about this, right? The story was something, yeah. um, the story of the patriarchs as well, you know, all of the Abraham and Sarah and Jacob and Isaac. And and so all of those stories were things when she when she talked in here about the felt boards, I was like, oh, the felt boards. <laughs> where, where we had all the little, you know, characters that you put on the felt boards, what? like stories. I um, used it just like yeah. two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I, I, was thinking I was probably not the only one that remembered kind of those things, but it does play a big part in what we talk about when we do children's education. So I guess the question I had that I was kind of interested to see what people thought is, it, we obviously feel like it's important enough to teach. Why is it there? Why do we feel like it's important, right? So tricky trying to lay that foundation, um, you know, if you're, if you're, you're wired like he is, it's like you're, you're grabbing at, what what resonates in your heart and you know that's what resonates in your kids heart it's like well god god did this yeah um, you yeah. know some people are wired in this way but um god said it i believe it that's all but, mm. you know and um there was a like a, a rigid part of myself growing up going then into that theology class where you know it's like oh wait a minute i mean you start taking things that you think are fundamentally true out of the foundation at what point do things start tipping over mm -hmm. so uh, so how do you teach kids what when it's, it's like what's important is god created it mm -hmm. and it's right good. and you know, yeah it, it doesn't matter, matter really if it was right and yeah seven. and yeah there's that other tension where you know we as like whatever intellectual thinking people 
do we really believe still that 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 Jesus did rise from the dead? That Jesus actually did heal people? That people in our time and place are somehow mysteriously sometimes not always, but sometimes actually healed? Do we open ourselves up to that other tension? Right. Yeah, it's not cut and dry either way. No. <laughs> So how do we teach our kids all that? Ah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. You're the teacher. What? Yeah. <laughs> there was a question on the teacher. I prefer a facilitator. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? Yeah. yeah, good teachers don't have all the answers. They right. say, hmm, let's talk about this. Let's research right. this. And sometimes it's enough to just go, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes there aren't easy answers. I think we try to teach as much as we can mm -hmm. so that people have choices mm -hmm. so that because I think learning is being the process that it is if we don't have if we don't have the information that we need to make those choices mm -hmm. it gets stymied and mm -hmm. and that's what we're trying to prevent and so I think for I think most Christians would say we teach it because it's a part of the Bible, <laughs> but that's not necessarily the reason. Nancy, you're trying to avoid eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just it. It seems like the logical place to start. I mean, if you started with a story about David. Some smart kid's going to say, well, where'd he come from? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it hmm. started at the beginning. Okay. Yeah. If you want to start a nerdy, good argument with a biblical scholar, uh, you try and convince them that the first words of the Bible are in the beginning. Because the mm -hmm. Hebrew words uh, that are there are um, very complicated to put together. Uh, and in fact, some would say that it's not uh, translatable. Oh, really? That And so for me, <clears throat> that's cool. um, so hi, I'm Janie. I'm a friend of Matson's. I'm also a pastor. So when, I, <laughs> so when I say when I took Hebrew in seminary, I'm not trying to show off. They made me take it. Um, uh, it was the best lesson I probably learned in all of seminary is that God tells us from the beginning, I am a mystery. You can search and search and search and search, but you will never know the answer until we meet face to face. That's that until we come into and find out what the dome rat actually is when we come into glory, then we get to know what this means. Right. But we then that's the joy that we are given from the beginning. We get to search, we get to wrestle, we get to ask all the questions and let the questions sit on the table until we come to an understanding and then allow it to change as we grow up, mm -hmm. as we grow in faith and understanding. Right. So, yeah. There's still something to ask, where did the dinosaurs come from? <laughs> <laughs> and you tell them it's well, a book of hesitation. <laughs> No, I mean, some of my, some, especially when you're browsing certain uh, Christian bookstores in certain parts of the country, all of those coloring books with Jesus yeah. riding dinosaurs, some of my favorite nonsense literature I've ever seen. <laughs> so, John. So, the, the author never really explains what she meant by her title, Inspire. And I think she's referring to the Bible as being God's inspired word. Mm -hmm. But how do I, deal with this thing of, of, you know, some of it was intended to do something that's not obvious. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do I throw it away? Do I but just take it lightly? Right. I And I think, because we're, we're, while we're still hovering over Genesis chapter one, there are still a couple more questions that we're going to play with that. But that question is really going to relate to the second Genesis passage we want to take a look at. So keep keep the candle burning on that one. <laughs> so. um, I think we we address some things. Like part of the importance of the origin story is that God created things, right? That we put God in a place of power over creation, and He has a nature of cre of creating, right? Mm -hmm. um, I also thought it was interesting to kind of think about 
how the early Jewish people, like why, what is the connection for them, right? So not just us, because we can answer how we feel about it today, but why was it important for them for this to be in there? Mm -hmm. What what about the relationship between God and creation was important to their religious practices and and thoughts? <laughs> well, it's saying God chose them, right? Mm -hmm. Somehow, <laughs> uh, kind of lends authority to their existence, I guess, mm -hmm. or identity, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I could hear this, but that has nothing to do with creation. Because God's choice of them happened long after creation yeah. with Abraham. How then, many years that was. <laughs> isn't that part of like the family story though? It's like, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is. Well, the family story I, is it's still yeah, where did it all start? <laughs> God, God created. God us created. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it has to go back to who did this in the first place? Mm -hmm. Who made this? <laughs> Chose the immense power that God had, mm -hmm. that he could take nothing, mm -hmm. create the heavens and the earth, and give it some sort of organization. Mm -hmm. And, and that, when we talk about God the Father, we're talking about God the Creator. Mm -hmm. um, it, and in that world where there were other religions with their own creation stories, a, a sense of power over the world mm -hmm. puts their God above the other ones that are out there, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a way of defining God? Mm -hmm. Artist? I... You made the mistake of making eye contact, so. <laughs> <laughs> I like what she said. Put their God over everybody else's. <laughs> a very human mm -hmm. Thing. <laughs> People right, uh, want their God to be the most important rather than thinking about one God. Mm -hmm. That's really good. One God. That's mm -hmm. important. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. And I think we kind of talked about what it tells about us because we've kind of shared our own yes. things. So we could probably skip over that and get, because I do want to spend some time on the next section because oh, yeah. what John was alluding to, I think we're going to have some good discussion right. on. So um, Genesis 32, 22 through 32 is the next section. I can just read this. I, I love this story. Okay, go ahead. Can I read this one? Okay. Can you read the Bible? Yes, you can. I can, can read the Bible. Okay. Thank you. Yay. Okay. Um, the same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabba. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise, everything that he had. Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket because he struck Jacob on the hip socket and the thigh muscle. Which I think, I love that story for a lot of different reasons. It, because when you, again, and I love this translation. This is the NRSV that I'm looking at. It strips out some of the interpretation that other translations will sort of put in there to try to sort of say this is God that he was fighting because that it, it sort of spoils the reveal at the end of the story, and then it ends with cooking instructions. Yeah. <laughs> it's like what? But you know that's what that basically is. Don't eat this muscle because it's God's favorite for some reason. <laughs> Um, so what do you think about the fact that Jacob challenged God to a wrestling match yeah. and then didn't let go until he received a bless blessing? Like, what does that make you think about Jacob? 
gutsy. <laughs> and he had a good grip. Wasn't he the one that was born after he saw a gravity? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had some of that connection. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Like it, it. it wasn't much for God that, that he couldn't beat wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> right. But uh, he was just kind of like a bulldog playing playing with a toy. You know, and he, <laughs> right. he, he wasn't going to let it go. Right. I, it was his total focus that he was mm -hmm. he, he was going to run off with it. Mm -hmm. But I think the idea of the thigh muscle is that that's the largest muscle in the body mm -hmm. too. And I think that has some significance. Mm -hmm. it, it's like a One. three year old One. grabbing his father's leg. Right. And thinking he's wrestling with him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then pulling that thigh muscle out of joint is his dad's. Yeah. Your body compensates with a three year old grabbing. Anyway, but yeah. Where does it say that Jacob challenged God? I don't see that. I'm trying to reread it. So if you're, so it's sort of implied that there was some kind of challenge because if you look at verse 24, Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. God. So he's just like, I'm hanging out by myself. Hey, there's another guy. Want to fight? I mean, and it's not really clear yeah. exactly yeah. how we got into that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah but it says the man wrestled with <clears throat> right. Jacob. Yeah, I just wondered if we. I don't know. That's, that's fair. That's well, maybe it could be. Well, verse twenty six. So I'm sorry, I, but I will not let go unless you bless me. Right. So he's like saying, "I'm, I'm gonna." Yeah. yeah. Right. So doesn't matter who started the fight. Jacob's right. not he's letting it go. Yeah. So that's the important. Hmm. Right. But Jacob has had conversation with God earlier in the chapter. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not like this is his first encounter with God, and also there are angels around. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know what so, but it, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, you got to read a little of the backstory in order to see how he's comfortable suddenly mm -hmm. having this person that he identifies as God mm -hmm. uh, and wrestling with him, feeling confident to do sure. that. Yeah. Sure. It is interesting that obviously the author that wrote both of these stories put God on a big cosmological power place, but also something that interacted directly with his creation, right? So kind of an interesting piece that obviously the Jewish people believed both that he was all powerful and that he was directly connected to them in some way, right? Mm -hmm. What's the significance of let me go for the day is breaking? I don't know, maybe God was a vampire on the trip. Oh, <laughs> Why didn't I say that? <laughs> I have no idea. Oh, and again, everybody else would see. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Well, no, it could be that. But, yeah. but no, like, I mean, that stuck out to me too, Nancy. It was like, why, why did that matter? And again, of course, I immediately jumped to vampires. <laughs> because I was wrestling like, all night. Like, You've got to be exhausted. Yeah, maybe it's like, come on, man. I'm tired. Let me go. Yeah. Right. Maybe it's you can't see me in the dark. Mm. Mm. Oh. oh. Yeah. Right. Because yeah, um, Moses couldn't look at God's face. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so how come Jacob could? Right. Because, you, be. you know, he's, he's got, you know, because I am the one who saw God's face. But most was saying, you can't see my face or it will destroy you. That's why he was placed behind the, the rock when God passed by. I'll let you see my backside, but you can't see my face because it's too much for you. Maybe mm -hmm. God just put on a Spider Man mask or something. We're not. I'm still thinking about the wrestling theme. <laughs> you can write your own story. I could. I could. Yeah. That. There is an argument to be made mm -hmm. in a Reformed Trinitarian belief that if Christ was with God from the beginning and God is Christ and Christ is God, and we know Christ to be in human form, yes. there is a Trinitarian argument to be made that, uh, and you know, we call Jesus Lord, mm -hmm. the argument to be made that he wrestles with Christ. So this so is a Christophany? Christophany? Is that what you call this? Christophany, Old Testament, or what do you call it? The almost yeah. shows up in the Old Testament. Is that yeah. what I was wondering. An argument could be made. <laughs> but it's just what some people would call it. Uh, it's a Christological view of it, yeah. Yep. Okay. yeah. That's cool. Because, well, you know, be. we know that the human form of God yeah. was yes. prone to breaking down and get tired. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And to have a face. And have magical hip displacement powers. 
Well, Jesus, I, there's no record that Jesus walked with the walked with the a limp, but <laughs> that's a book I would write. Jesus didn't walk with a limp, Jacob. Right. No, I'm, I'm, yeah, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> so on the, on the hip thing, mm -hmm. uh, my wife tells the story, Tim Mackey, he's a theologian down in Oregon, I think, and he tells the story that the hip is important because basically Jesus is a dirty fighter <laughs> kicked him close to the gonads. And, oh. and the reason was God has claiming control over his fertility or his future ability mm -hmm. to... Right, and like when and when you see later in the the Joseph story cycle, the whole uh, place your hand under my thigh mm -hmm. thing, to sort of, that again is a bit that's obscuring what was going on a little bit in the translation, but it was with that same idea that you're sort of swearing on my progeny, all right? When I'm basically when I'm going to bless you, you need to do this, so I'm blessing you with my like progeny. So yeah, so I think that there is something there to that idea that God's fighting really dirty here. Like really dirty, and yet it's a blessing somehow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I liked her her question. If you met Jesus today, would you challenge him to arm wrestle? <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you think that figuratively or literally? Um, how do you think people in the church would react to you if you did? Mm. <laughs> Let me go right. Pretty fighting. I mean, we call it dirty fighting. That's just, mm -hmm. it's, fighting is dirty. It shouldn't matter how it gets done. Yeah. Fighting mm -hmm. just is dirty. Dirty. Mm -hmm. Okay, just want to make that clear. <laughs> <laughs> so Jesus was now a we, So this is an indication of Wayne dirty. Brown's philosophy of battle. <laughs> so if you're getting into a scrap with Wayne, you now know. <laughs> Anything goes, man. It's a fight. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> But I'm a Quaker pacifist, so I mean, <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's interesting that Israel, the country Israel, mm -hmm. um, Israel means people who struggle with God, correct? And, and I think that the country of Israel is struggling with God, and um, now, and so I was like, hmm, they're still struggling, and maybe they're limping, <laughs> you know, and it's like. The story doesn't say who started the wrestling match. No. Right. No. You know, like you, you just you start fighting some random guy that you see when you're standing alone in the desert. Yeah. And it's just kind of how it goes. Random guy. I just, I keep thinking about challenging Jesus to an arm wrestling. You know, like you know, if I were just, to, you know, you just pop in this room. So Jesus went arm wrestling, you know. Right. I, I, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't yeah, but I have a lot Jake. of questions. So yeah, yeah, I, exactly. I, 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 I
And how does wrestling with God? <laughs> so sorry, say again. How does wrestling with God relate to submitting to God? Oh yeah, that's an excellent question too. Mm -hmm. I wrestle I have, right. I have no idea. Yeah, because he had to have submitted to God because he ended up hanging on to God too. Mm -hmm. you know, he just want, he still wants him. Yeah, it's interesting. I think the word struggle is interesting because I think if you look at how struggle is used in the American church, it's mm -hmm. got a very negative connotation to it. Um, it's struggling with sin or struggle. I mean, it's it's a, a deficit or a, mm -hmm. a negative trait. Mm -hmm. Some we try to avoid. Right. Mm -hmm. oh, or that there's something sinful about you because you're struggling. Right. Mm -hmm. right. right. Yeah. It's like, right. oh, you're struggling with your faith. Yeah. Oh, no. No. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. And so how does, I mean, how does this give us a room to do that? Right. And and, and yeah. Jacob was still faithful. Like you said, he didn't walk away from God at the end. Yeah. Right? right. And so <laughs> he lived away. Right. <laughs> Correct. I wasn't left laying there. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't dead. <laughs> right. right. Or so wounded that he couldn't move. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. He was still able to get up and move. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of the limp, um, physical therapist speaks. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that was not a thing back in the day. They had other like life and death things to think about. Um, but I, one of the things that kind of um, came to me, if we talk about, if we do use the analogy of of Jacob wrestling with God and talk about how we wrestle with things in our faith journey, does wrestling with Scripture have consequences? Because he mm. he got the blessing. But he walked away with a limp, and so I just kind of hit me like, "What? What is that? What does our limp look like?" We don't have an easy know-it-all, six thousand year old Earth. Mm -hmm. We don't know it all for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we we tend to look at the physical as being more important than the spiritual. Mm -hmm. And I, I can kind of see where this may be saying that just because we have a limp doesn't mean we haven't learned something. And is it worth the limp to get the blessing, right? Absolutely. Well, it doesn't feel like it at the moment. No. I... <laughs> yeah. I, go, I go back to the way he's going on and, um, I would I would feel pretty confident that every one of us in the room could tell of those moments of the dark night. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when the tears do not stop and the anger or the fear or the pain or whatever is so deep you just think, yeah. I'm not gonna get through this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that to me is wrestling. If I come out on the other side with I still have some kind of even if it's in tatters, some kind of faith in God that says God loves me in spite mm -hmm. of all this. Mm -hmm. My scar, my lip is, I'm really humble. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I'm grateful, but I have a limp. I do. And that somehow in that weakness, maybe I'm different, better. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know yet, but hmm. I definitely come out with humility. Do you think it makes you have a place within the church that's helpful? Mm -hmm. Right. Because if we've walked those places or are walking those places, are we more open to listening to people who are also walking those places instead of being like, this is the right way and you just need to just figure it out because this is how it is, right? Um, if we've been through that journey where we've been beaten up a little bit, but we still feel like it's worth being on the journey, does that make us a welcoming and safe place for people who are also on the journey, right? Mm -hmm. None of us have it all figured out. Mm -hmm. And I like the, I'm going to butcher this quote. But, <laughs> yeah, you go right ahead. Um, the, from um, the Chronicles of Narnia, I love when he's talking about Aslan the lion. And he, he says, you know, he asks if Aslan is safe. And he said, well, no, he's not safe, but he's good, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so that kind of image mm -hmm. of this is not going to be an easy journey. It was mm -hmm. not guaranteed to pave with gold and streets, but, um, but, but he's good and worth following, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the ways 
I struggle or wrestle with God is in my weaknesses. I think they shouldn't be there. Hmm. And I, I just went to 2 Corinthians. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. Mm -hmm. And that's really challenging. Because <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. just as Americans, we don't like to be weak. Mm -hmm. And as a person, I don't like to be weak. Mm -hmm. Are we saying that certainty about certain things in scriptures is not good? That ambiguity is better? Do we, are we putting a higher value on our struggle and beauty argument? Then, I mean, I we there is kind of a little snobbery going here. People who have it all figured out, who sort of, <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> but you know, is it possible for those people to, as Christians, to love God, to be in a good space? It's a good question. Being certain. And possibly even, well, I, mean, I think we hold a lot of wrong ideas, mm -hmm. theologically speaking, about God or about the universe and everything else. I mean, if you agree, who are we for these things? Mm -hmm. So uh, I go back to Michael saying about humility. I mean, the, it's probably the only way to be before God, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Like, right. man, oops. <laughs> right. I do wrestle with that. We've actually, the three of us have been having conversations about that this weekend because that's what happens when Jamie comes to visit. We sit there and talk about all kinds of random things. Uh -huh. um, fun to one person is fun to another person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do know people who are in more uh, literal, translational, I don't even know what the word I'm looking for, but I, I've known those people who really find solace in there and are somehow okay with overlooking the questions so that they can keep the house of cards standing right mm -hmm. and so my question is is that okay for them and and maybe but I think the thing that gets challenging is when somebody takes that and makes it the overarching for everyone else as well yeah. right yeah. and so what someone's approach to the bible may be very someone in the continent of africa may look at scripture very differently and i think it can speak to them because the spirit speaks to them right and it looks different to me it speaks to me and it doesn't mean that either one of them doesn't have value but i think the question that i wrestle with is when does it become a problem when when we hold to that so much, it becomes a weapon or it becomes a way of dividing the body of Christ. And that's where I think it gets a little tricky. And I don't know what the answer to that is, Wayne, but that's where my brain's been wrestling. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it is possible to be certain and also be humble. I was just mm -hmm. while you're talking, I was thinking about my mom, or actually my stepmother. Um she I I remember her saying, What? You know, she says about creation, well, if we don't believe it happened in seven days. Where do we stop believing the rest of the scripture? Mm -hmm. Literals, right? Mm -hmm. But prayer warrior loved everybody, mm -hmm. loved God, loved us, mm -hmm. formed God, you know, gave me a good sense of who God is despite all the ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Okay, she's going to make it. Mm -hmm. Well, she's already there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And she'd probably say, Dang, Wayne, get it together. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I think if God's working in your life, humbleness toward God, toward others, being right. open, despite having some quirky little fixed points in our understanding of things, mm -hmm. transcends, you know, certain views. Right. And I think that fits in with the concept of grace. Like, I think that God, are, God finds us yeah. no matter where we are. I also how think did, oh, 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 like three dudes talking over one right how, how did the Methodists know that our class is ending? I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it yeah. just so convenient? Yeah. They're the right ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're right. They're like the Methodists. That's the real mystery there. Yeah, right. Bring it for the Presbyterians. Dan, do you want to? Just one. Her statement of the Jews use the scriptures as a conversation point. To start the conversation. The Christians often use it as a weapon. Yes. Or an ending, ending point. point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 
I think the weapon well, well yes, but, that's fair. Uh, yeah. Because but, weapons then, tend to end conversations. Yeah. 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 There will be no Bibles. <laughs> that's right. So next week we're gonna talk about deliverance stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. it is yeah. chapter two. Thank you all for great discussion. Yeah, that was good. It is super exciting to be around such a cool group of people who all have such interesting thoughts. So <laughs> thanks for helping me study the scripture just as much as I think we all sharpen each other a little bit. <laughs> you get to pray to finish. I do? Yep. Okay. Lord, our hips are out of joint, but it's worth it to keep fighting. Please bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can you include shoulders in here? <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. Okay.